Welcome to episode 34 of the Camerosity Podcast, the world's number one open source film photography podcast. My name is Mike Ekman, and we're recording on Sunday night because we didn't want to go a whole three weeks between episodes. From Yellow Springs, Ohio, the Camerosity gas master, Mr. Paul Reibold. How many storage lockers filled with cameras have you bought since the last time we talked? Well, I, I think there are three, though I've sort of lost track. Uh, I'm going to have to consolidate them into, into two pretty soon. Next, from Sydney, Australia, Mr. Theo Panagopoulos. How are you doing in your search for a Snyder 35? <laughs> Not very good. They're, um, they're as, uh, available as hen's teeth, so uh, they're not nowhere to be found. Um, I think I may have to just sort of fall back uh, onto a Nikka 5, which is what they were based on. And finally, from Gainesville, Florida, the owner of Volta Coffee, the man you never want to plan a trip to Columbia with, Mr. Anthony Rue. How are things going at the shop? Things are going well. You know, we uh, we really dodged the bullet with the, with the hurricane that passed through. And uh, we thought we were going to be a direct uh, hit. And instead, we were the place that everybody evacuated to. So uh, things were jumping. And I feel my heart goes out to the people in South Florida because uh, they, uh, you know, I think that we don't even really understand the extent to uh, how much damage there is. And uh, I imagine that that our our guests are going to see some uh, uh, saltwater damaged cameras coming in sometime soon. Yeah, it was uh, pretty scary. You know, Florida's been hit with hurricanes before, and depending on the angle, the the difference between, you know, some broken down trees and busted out windows versus complete, you know, and total destruction is uh, sometimes just where it lands, and this one did not hit in a good spot. But I'm glad that you're okay. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm still covering from COVID, so uh, officially three out of four of our hosts, we've gotten it. Uh, Anthony, you've you've, you've been the only uh, COVID... Uh, avoider but um uh like paul and theo you know mine wasn't too bad um i just i've gotten over the worst of it and uh you know three out of the four people in my house have gotten it my son somehow seems to have managed to dodge it too but uh it's definitely not fun this week we're going to talk camera repairs joining us is first time caller mr ryan jones ryan is a six-year employee and recent new owner of pro camera in charlottesville virginia welcome to the show ryan Hey, Mike. Thank you guys for having me on. I'm excited. Awesome. Why don't you uh, give us a little bit of background and just tell us about yourself, uh, Pro Camera. Um, I know some of the guys on the show are familiar with you and having sent things to you before, but we have listeners all over the world. So uh, maybe toot your own horn or something a little bit here. Sure. So we are a um, old school camera shop and full service film lab in Central Virginia. Um, I started here pushing six years ago when I was in undergrad at college and I was bugging the prior owner about fixing my Olympus 35 RC, which is sort of my gateway film camera. And he basically said, hey, you you come to the shop three times a week. You want a job? And I was like, absolutely. So I started selling stuff on eBay for ProCam and uh, worked there through college and then after college. And then um, recently found myself in the position to um, take over and take things forward. And Pro Camera is lucky to be one of the go-to repair resources for um, much of the eastern half of the United States. Um, We service um, a good number of cameras all up and down the the gamut of um, formats and and buy-in values. Um, And I trained initially under Bill Moretz, the founder of the business. He started Pro Camera in 83 um, in the Carolinas and then came up to Virginia. and he started my training and then COVID took over and he had to go home to kind of be away from the public. And that's when I started to dive deep into camera repair. That's great to hear. So you guys just do kind of a little bit of everything then, right? You don't specialize in any one particular brand or, or format then, huh? Yeah, we do a little bit of everything and I can speak to this later or now, but um, that's a, being able to work on most anything is a, a an important aspect to me. I want to be able to service the, you know, consumer mid-level 70s range finders up to the super high-end um, rare or medium format stuff. Is there anything that you just know I'm not going to bother touching that or is it you'll you'll try anything? I like to try to most any try most anything. Um, one of your recent episodes talking about the contacts uh, garage door shutters, Paul actually sent me um, an early, I think it's a, a one or a two, um, to dive into and, and start playing, uh, playing with. Um, so those shutters I've yet to tackle. 
and then um as as has been an, an interesting ongoing conversation in the camera repair and camera consumer world is the plastic point and shoots as much as we love them and as fun and convenient as they are um you know if i don't have a shell for them or if i haven't rendered a 3d file to print them or you know if i don't have the the flex cable unfortunately there's not a whole lot you can do so i I shy a little bit away from the fully automatic plastic point and shoot world um, and stick very strongly to fully mechanical systems, but I like to do a little bit of everything. Joining us is uh, Jess Ibarra. Jess has been on the show before. Uh, She's down in Australia with Theo. She owns her own place called Viva La, is it Viva La Camera or Viva La Film? Oh, it's Viva La Film, you guys. All right. Film. Hey, how are how are you guys? And uh, only the people on the show now can see uh, Jess, but she's actually repairing something as she's on the show. So I'm actually at work. So yeah, I'm actually repairing. <laughs> actually, this is this is a lens. But yeah. Okay. I'm actually learning lenses at the moment. What okay. are you working on? It's nothing very fancy, but it's a zoom, it's a zoom lens. Ah. Uh, it is a apochromatic sigma lens. Uh, it's mostly for learning than anything, just trying to figure out how every part of the mechanism works, what everything is doing, that sort of stuff. I'm glad to hear that since you're actually learning something, it's not actually one of my my pieces that's actually on your desk at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, your stuff is set with my actual bench at home. While we were talking, uh, Steve Rosenbach joined us. Uh, Steve, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Thank God. Should I introduce myself? Sure. I'm 72 years old now. I became a photographer a few days after I graduated from high school in uh, June of 67 with a um, Polaroid swinger. How about that? I got that for graduation from uh, Very nice. the presence of my, of my dad. And around year 2000, I bought a, uh, a Soviet, actually, I think it was my first was a Fed 3, and I became infatuated and, and fascinated by uh, Soviet Leica-derived and um, Contax clone uh, rangefinders. I had a whole collection of, of uh, Kami cameras at one point, including several um, Practicas. From 2009 onward, I've done uh, quite a number of uh, photo workshops and photo instruction, and I live now in... Um, Tewksbury, Massachusetts. Uh, I retired about seven years ago. And th- Mike, thanks to you and Theo and all you guys, you know, I, I was, you know, I went to uh, Gas uh, Anonymous a couple of years back. I hadn't bought a single camera. And, and in the last week, I, I bought uh, three cameras and one lens. <laughs> what did you buy? Well, let me show you. I bought a um, 19, it's an earlier, slightly earlier model. It's an SR1 from about 65. SRS was 67. And I found on eBay uh, this very nice SR1 from about uh, 1962, you know, not the first one. I think it's like the second or third model. And what I really like about it is that it says um, Kyoto Kogaku on the top. It does say Minolta. Right. That was their original name. Yeah, yeah. They didn't. A lot of Japanese companies didn't really adopt the name that we refer to them until much later. In fact, Nikon wasn't actually called Nikon until 1988. So right. they were still they were still Nippon Kugaku. You had mentioned Soviet cameras, and uh, I had asked Ryan earlier about anything he wouldn't touch. Uh, so the guys and I had d- talked ahead of time, and we wanted to come prepared with a camera to bug you about. So I'm going to tie in my Soviet cameras here, and I have this thing called a Salyut. Uh, oh, the Salyut, is, yeah. The uh, um... so it's this, it's essentially like a similar to like a Hasselblad clone. Uh, this is the camera that would eventually v- evolve into the Kiev. Um, right. I think the Kiev eighty eight. And yeah. uh, per Vlad Kern, um, these things are impossible to fix. So he says that if I ever wanted to get it fixed, uh, the only place I can send it to is Airx in Ukraine, which I don't really want to do that. But uh, the it works great actually. This camera is in fairly good shape. But it's got a focal plane shutter um, that that um, it it does that thing that some focal plane shutters do, where the one side is darker than the other when it fires the, the exposure. So I kind of want to get someone to to get it working, but I'm like I kind of feel like maybe I should just leave it on the shelf. So uh, Ryan, I don't know if you uh, feel uh, brave enough to want to try a medium format Soviet six by six camera, but uh, if you ever want some practice, I could send this to you. Love to, love to dive into it. 
and just to get the balance between North and Southern Hemisphere. There you go. Uh, yeah. Jess, you might, Jess, you may end up having this coming your way at some point again. Yeah. Actually, I'm very lucky I've acquired a mentor. Uh, he's one of the camera main camera technicians here at Camera Fix. Uh, and uh, he's an expert on Russian cameras. He's actually Russian. Uh, I don't know if you're in the comments say hi. This is, this is Alex, and he's been a camera repairer for, um, yeah, for a long time in his, in his life. Hey, Alex. Welcome to the show. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Nice to meet you. Uh, Alec, we were just talking about Russian cameras and we were both pulling up these things for saying that we need lots oh, of repairs. On. <laughs> oh, <laughs> That's the reaction I was I looking for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what. Um, uh, when I used to walk in England in the 90s, uh, they asked me to be a representative for Salute or Kiev or whatever company. But just because uh, I used to do too many of those cameras, I understand that after one fault, you have another fault. After another <laughs> fault, you have another, another fault. And, and, and that's really, <laughs> no. <laughs> that's never ending revolt. I, I bought this one new in 99 in Moscow when I was working in Moscow. Yeah, and it's even worse. Yes. And uh, it broke. When I was back in London, I had it repaired. Possibly by even you. Who knows? But, uh, but, then, uh, uh, but then um, I think it's only ever had one roll of film go through it that's worked. <laughs> and then that's all, that's all I've managed to get through it. Yep. Uh, yeah. And um, I'm not telling that that's totally fully Russian fault, Soviet fault, because um, uh, you remember it's a copy of um, um, <clears throat> Hasselblad 1000, more or less copy. It's, it's not exact copy, but uh, sort of a copy. And um, uh, uh, in Sweden, they get rid from that model quite fast, you know. <laughs> 1,000 is also disappeared in three years, I think, or, or, or somewhere. So it's a combination of um, yes. bad model yes. and bad, and yes. bad yes. workmanship. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, 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 that's true. And after that, it's, it's, it's disappeared. And uh, in uh, Russia and Soviet Union, they still manufacture it for many years, but it is a disaster camera. Uh, I have one advice for you. Uh, it's better to find a Kiev 6 camera, you know, uh, which is, looks like Panther. You know, that big, 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 uh, uh, you know, looks like Pentax 67, but it's actually six by six. And that's quite reliable stuff. It's okay. Right, okay. You know, okay. you can, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. You can uh, trust, more or less trust uh, to this camera. Yes. Right. And, uh, uh, but don't buy Pentax one, no. <laughs> <laughs> the best advice is not to fix the cell you because even if you manage to fix it, it'll break a minute later. Maybe, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. A minute yeah. later. Very true. Very true. And you never know. You never know what's next. You know, you just open like a, uh, you know. So, Mike, we were talking earlier about uh, since we got Jess and uh, and Ryan both here and, and Alex that, uh, you know, we we could have a round of what's busted at your house. And uh, I have a near mint Yashica flex that uh, has one shutter speed, no matter what you're uh, trying to fire it. At. Oh, well, that's too bad. Yeah. So that's going to go out to Ryan on, uh, on Tuesday. And the other one is uh, a Nikon S. Very it, cool. It, uh, the only thing that's weird about it is, I mean, the slow shutter speeds are, are not, are non-existent, but the, the odd thing is the lens is perfect, but it doesn't lock at infinity. You know, there's a, a lock on the top when it reaches infinity. It's to be locked there, and there's a little tab you push down to move it. It isn't locking. So I'm going to send you the lens, too, uh, so you can, uh, when you get into the body, I'm sure that piece is in the body because I had tried it with several other lenses, and they didn't lock either. Ryan, we've been having some discussion about these Nikon rangefinders off, off list here. Um, and Mike has been quick to point out that on the older models, that hazy rangefinders are the, the bane of those models. Uh, do you 
in your experience, have you come across a fix for those or is it just something where the way that the, the prisms glued together, that that is just something you live with, with, you know, with the Nikons? It's a bit of both. Um, there can be more um, like surface level accumulation of haze and fungus on the frontmost facing optics, as well as uh, the back end facing the photographer. If you can get in there um, and pulling the whole rangefinder block is, is fairly easy once you have the top cover and the front standard off, you can give it a good thorough cleaning of, of the optics that are accessible. And that will usually bring it if it's not already a bad case, it'll bring it up to what it should have been back in the day. Um, but then, as you said, there, there are the cemented sections of the prism um, that just have not aged well. And this is one of the funny realities of being a young repair person is I can't, I can't say what they looked like back in the day. So I can't say for sure, you know, how bright they were out the box. But my impression of the system is that they were never, never quite, you know, like a type brightness, at least post M3 type brightness, um, simply based on the size of the optics and how much light transmission is occurring in those systems. Um, so I, I don't know that they were all that shockingly bright to begin with. And part of what that rangefinder system, part of the principle that that one operates on is actually bringing, bringing the brightness of the entire finder down a bit to make those frame lines appear quite bright. Whereas the M systems um, have frame line illumination, um, more of an illuminating approach, so they can keep both the frame lines bright and your transmitted, you know, composition image bright. So, um, yeah, good cleaning, and then um, sometimes if you put, uh, some people will put gels over um, the uh, as you're looking at the camera, the far left patch, and sometimes just changing that color creates you know what feels to be a more apparent discrepancy in the split image and makes it a little easier to bring them together well also i had heard that a lot on the sp in particular the frame lines are actually painted on mm -hmm. so when you try to clean them uh, a lot of times you'll clean the frame lines right off the uh off the glass i, I don't know if that's true on the s2 or s4 or s3 but it was certainly ca case on the sp yeah absolutely and it's such a, it's such a brittle coating. And, um, it, it is similar to, I had a, an M4, um, frame line assembly. The masks that slide are, are physical individual pieces of metal, but the actual frame line projection piece is a pigment, uh, laid onto, uh, the center optic of the range finder where the condensing lens is. Um, and so if you get, start to get a little bit of separation, and hazing is right in your patch. You can't go in there to fix that without dissolving the frame lines, unfortunately. Well, I can tell you the S2 uses an Elbata type finder where the frame lines are actually silvered on the rear piece of glass. So it's not actually on anywhere inside the viewfinder. That's not to say they can't be etched or scratched off, but the, the simpler design I, so just stepping back a little, when I first got into um, Nikon range finders, I was heavily influenced by Bob Rodoloni, who's been on the show many times. And he said, if you want to collect Nikon range finders, you get the SP. If you want to shoot Nikon range finders, you get the S2. Um, and what the S2 doesn't have that the SP does actually makes the viewfinder simpler. It's st it stands up to time a lot better. Um Ryan, you said, how, how does it compare to an M3? You know, the M3 for all and, you know, things that it does well, it, it probably has the best range finder of any, you know, just traditional range, 35 millimeter range finder I've ever seen at least. Uh, so I would suspect that even brand new, you know, back in the fifties, they probably weren't as bright as the M3 is. Um, but I can say though, that having held, I've probably held about a dozen SPs, both black and chrome versions, and only about three of them. I would say the main U viewfinder would be usable. The SP has two viewfinders, actually. There's the 28 millimeter and 35, which is in a separate window. That one holds up fine. It's the main one that just they get cloudy really, really bad. Uh, and that just kills the value. But um, just comparatively... I agree with Bob and it's not just because he said it. So I agree with that. I've just, from my own experience, you know, I have a, an S2 right here 
um, that's in excellent condition. And I look through the viewfinder, you guys can't see it, but it is 98% of an M3, I would say. And, and, and it's in great shape. But um, I wanted to say, Paul, I grabbed my S like yours and I wanted to see if the if it had an infinity lock, and, and it does. For some reason, yeah. I thought it, it did not. But you're, you're right; it is supposed to lock. The, so. the little uh, the little pin on the front that is release pin that's not moving. So yeah, I think that's uh, it's probably just gummed up or rusted. Even I'm sure good hypersonic cleaning will fix that up right away. Uh, Ryan will lay hands on it. It'll it'll, it'll be okay. <laughs> So Alex, what did you say you sent uh, you sent Ryan as a black uh, three, a black Barnack? Yep, yeah, black Barnack. He's probably got it back on the shelf if he wants to show and tell. Uh, and then yeah, uh, let me see if I can get my hands on it. Keep yeah. going. And then a uh, OM one N uh, that I found locally. It just needs some needs some love and uh, a few lenses to go along with it. My uh, my wife complains the Nikon F is too heavy for her to carry. So. Were they, were they Zuko lenses? Yes. Yep. The uh, 2835 and the uh, just the 518. The 2835, there was a discussion earlier today about that lens. Um, that was a, that's the earliest lens they made in the, in the wide angles. They replaced it with a 2828 um, soon after the 35 came out. And the 35 had a single coating and the 28s, so there were two versions, one with a, a green coating and one with a purple coating that uh, had more multiples. There's your guy. There you go. All right. <laughs> What's the problem? Good, good hands. Uh, the the haziness in the uh, range finder, that's pretty pretty gnarly. But uh, other than that, it's in fairly good shape. Slow speeds are okay. It's in surprisingly good shape, especially the wind on and, and just initial, you know, impression of the curtains. It's, it's surprising how little all things considered a need it's a good camera yeah it's i i took that with me to uh i was in greece this summer and uh i had yet to prove that it shot a good roll of film since i acquired it and yet i took that uh with <laughs> me on an international trip <laughs> and it 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 was a it was a champ it it took it handled it very well despite uh struggling to focus other than that it was uh it it uh, yeah produced pretty great images and it's a great size to carry around everywhere. They're great cameras to use, but I must admit I'm I'm actually I think it's zero for three at the moment with Bar Barnex style like um, like type cameras and copies. They they kick my ass every time. I um I seem to ha collect them and either create or or have um, the the shutter. Uh, cloth uh, pinholes and cuts and and like going through those, which seems to be quite common. Is that is that something Ryan that you 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 do as well? Is actually work on the shutter mechanisms? Yeah, yep. Those guys, I I'll take down to the curtains and and do fresh curtains on them. Um, uh, a lot of the kind of the original way to do it is to wrap the curtain around the lath and then sew it. Um, I've yet to begin sewing them. If a purist requests for aesthetic reasons because they want to see that stitch, you know, through the lens mount, um, uh, I've done one or two that way, but usually we'll bring it down to the curtains. And um, if the ribbons are healthy and the timing of the ribbons is good, the ribbons remain. And there's a way to put fresh, fresh silk in without having to pull the ribbon. But if the ribbons feel compromised, which is probably, you know, 40% of the time, depending on how the camera's been cared for, the ribbons and the curtains and everything comes out. Um, and then I make fresh curtains and I use a, um, a type of epoxy to reattach them to the last um, and get it back in there and retime it. What, what do you use for fresh curtains, considering these cameras were made like, you know, 60, 70 years ago? Is it a like for like material? It's, um, I use a rubberized silk that I get from Japan. Um, and it it has a very similar appearance to the the M stuff, uh, as Jess may be able to tell you. Sourcing these raw materials can be kind of catch as catch can, you know, like what happens to be on eBay at that point in time. And then post COVID, a lot of suppliers have just wholesale stopped, you know, trying to send anything to the U.S. So there's just one one resource I buy. Um, I think it's like 12 by 12 inch sheets of rubberized silk and uh, you know, it's got the cloth appearance on the one side and the rubber on the other. It works great. 
I see Jess nodding your head. Are you having the same problem post COVID getting raw materials? Yeah, uh, especially with the traveling times or that postage time from from uh, China. Uh, we do get quite a lot of parts from China and just uh, or we have a lot of suppliers that say that they're going to deliver on the on the purchase of a particular part and it just it never happens because maybe they're close already or maybe they have run out of the parts and uh, especially with Nikon uh, closing down their uh, facilities in Japan or their um, it's uh, people are scrambling in for parts and I think it's a lot more people repairing as well like when we're all kind of looking for same parts for the same repairs yeah that, that's kind of where my questioning sort of start coming from from in terms of those cloths um, because yeah I can understand that you can take bits off other cameras uh, you know gears and metal bits and, and so on but those those bits are almost consumable to some extent because they wear down um mm. yeah is there is there a future for those or are we looking at potentially that's where the the breaking point is going to be for these type of cameras yeah i mean manufacturing is going to be fundamentally the future of keeping these cameras alive because you know the term and concept of consumable is a spectrum right i would most certainly put curtains on the shallower end of that spectrum in terms of yeah every you know every 25 35 years they probably have to be done um, but even then, we're not far enough into keeping these cameras alive to know for sure. So the rubber coatings on the silk from the early Leica was an organic rubber compound. And so it it oxidizes and it ages. And that's why we get the flaking and the pinholing and everything. So, you know, if we could go to China where I'm sourcing these curtains from and say, hey, what polymers are you using in your rubberized silk? We'd maybe have a better idea of how that rubber is going to age 40 years down the line. But even still, it's it's that minutia of detail in terms of like, how are these polymers going to age? How are they going to behave? So certainly, yeah, the rubberized curtains are going to be a consumable, but then, uh, you know, hopefully we treat them well. But yeah, the, the small brass and plastic gears are consumable on this end of the spectrum. And until we um, can get a CAD file of, you know, every gear in a Hasselblad shutter charge system or whatever, yeah, it's a, there's a finite number of these things out there. So manufacturing is like the solution moving forward and it's going to be 3D printing and, and CNC. That's a really interesting point because uh, I know Jess has mentioned this a number of times, the 3D printing. And I've, I've recently subscribed to a group of people who are actually have found old Mamiya 7 parts, which they're measuring and having 3D CAD, um, CAD files produced so that if you drop your Mamiya 7 and you know apart from the fact that you'll be crying because it's a 10 thousand dollar camera these days <laughs> it's it's um that they will actually be able to have you know replacement bodies yeah and the next step is obviously that the gears and all that is that something that differentiates say the younger repair people now compared to some of the old crusty guys who who you know who, who won't look at that and and we're starting to look into the future of um uh, of producing parts that way rather than relying on, on large-scale manufacture yeah yeah like small batch additive manufacturing processes like 3d printing um because they are the future and because folks my age maybe had the opportunity i mean not quite my age but a little bit younger like i know 18 19 year olds who like their tech class in high school has a 3d printer you know and so they're getting their initial introduction into these technologies far, far sooner um, than you'd expect. And so those kinds of manufacturing processes are becoming easier to get a hold of. And yeah, I mean, I can tell you from experience, the man who trained me, he's 73. And I remember the first day I had the 3D printer in the shop and he was visiting. He was like, you know, holy heck, <laughs> that's really cool. That's that I wish I had that because every time he needed a spindle or a gear or whatever, you'd have to go to the machine shop and spend half a day or a day drawing it up and cutting it, um, which we still do. Like I have a lathe and a milling machine and you make that decision on a piece of gear or a solution in a repair. Am I going to use this piece enough to put everything on hold and go sit in front of the computer with a set of calipers for six hours and mock this part up? Or can I just go get some brass stock and, get on the lathe and just get this done so we can get this repair done. So um, yeah, forgive the long answer, but yeah, the youngsters are definitely 
really good at 3D printing and I think that's the future of it. Um, it's just finding enough hands and enough time to, to build out that library of parts. For the curtains themselves, is there anybody that you're aware of that's attempting to replace cloth, rubberized cloth curtains with steel or titanium like Canon? You know, like the Canon P? I mean, is that even uh, an option? If the if the sheet stock could be sourced, I would imagine it's an option. Um, however, the degree to which you would probably have to bring a camera down in terms of disassembly um, for titanium sheet application to be feasible and the skill you'd need to put in titanium curtains without a single kink like Canon was doing. Uh, I mean, more power to you if you can figure out how to do that without losing your mind. Um, Alan, Alan Starkey is actually doing that on Leica M's. Is uh, he really? Yeah, he's uh, in England. He's putting in uh, titanium shutters. He just did one, I think, for Robert Jagic. Wow. But uh, he's a first, the only person I know of that's figured out how to do it. But you're right. He does take them down to bare bones. I mean, he goes down. He's a frame off. Yeah. When Alan does them, because that's the only way you can really get in to, to get them, uh, get them seated and get them time. Mm -hmm. Well, as we continue on our, our round robin, I've got sort of the, the opposite end question. I'm a fanatic for the most basic full manual SLRs and have just sort of like tried to keep up. Like, can I get as many different, just absolute bare bones manual SLRs? And I let these guys talk me into getting a Canon EF and mm -hmm. found a body on eBay for $15. It looks like it came out of the box yesterday. It, I mean, it just, I mean, the, the, the Japan pass sticker is on there. Everything just looks absolutely brand new. Uh, of course, for $15, it was camera untested. I don't know how to test this myself. And I'll be damned if it doesn't have the strangest error I've ever seen in a camera. And on all the cameras I have, I've never had one that, uh, let me unlock it here. When you go to cock the camera, when you release it, the shutter fires, all right? So there's no using the uh, um, the shutter button. The irony is that it's still accurate at all of its speeds. Um, <laughs> and it kind of reminds me of my, my Nikonos 3, you know, with its like weird push uh, push to shoot button on the, on the uh, winder. Do you have a battery on the camera? Uh, yeah, it's got the two batteries on the bottom. I put fresh batteries in it. Actually, shorting on the top, and it and the shutter is going is disabling the magnet as you um as you cock. Uh huh. Uh, the current is going down the um probably the battery check somewhere and this and action in the camera as the shutter shoot. So it just probably needs cleaning. A good okay. CLA will get it going. Um. So so my question was going to be that. Uh, as you have these older 1970s and 60s cameras that you might spend $15 on, is it like repairable or is it go buy another camera for $15 until you get one that works? In, in my opinion, it's repairable. Like I said, we're trying to keep all cameras alive. But I guess if you can get another one that's working for $15 as a buyer, that's probably a much nicer option. <laughs> well, this one may be coming to you, Ryan, next time you have a window that's open. Sure. I've said this multiple times. The Canon EF is probably my favorite of the manual focus Canons. Um, it, it does use the batteries, but only for the really long shutter speeds. I think one second and slower, it can go down. I don't have the review up in front of me, but I think it can do something like 120 second exposures um, using the electromagnetic shutter, but everything half a second and faster is, is mechanical. So it does work without batteries. It's basically Canon's response to the, um, the Nikkermat EL, which later became the Nikon EL2. So it's, it's the full bodied, like an FTB, uh, FTTX, you know, all their 60s and very early 70s uh, Canon mechanical cameras. It would have been sold around the exact same time the original F1 came out. And the F1 obviously was their pro camera, but the EF would have been their advanced consumer model. I think even back then it had a retail price of like 500 bucks, which, you know, when you adjust for inflation is, is really, really high. So that was a, a top of the line camera for its day. But um, to find one in good shape, I mean, Anthony you only have 15 bucks in it. You know, I know I'm one of the people that convinced you to buy it in the first place. But even if I hadn't, I still would say that's a camera worth fixing. Yeah, it's I not agree. Like, 
it's not like the AE one, you know, which people have no problem sending off to be fixed, which is, has tons of plastic parts. You know, even if you get it to work, it could just break again. Uh, I, I feel as though the EF, I have one right here, um, is a camera that's worth spending some money on. Cause once it is working in good shape, you're probably good for another couple of decades. I would, I would presume. And, and of course, Canon glass is as good as anything out there too. Ryan, my, my other one I'll, I'll, I'll throw at you. Uh, is is one of my white whales and that is i keep on buying voigtlander ultramatic cs's trying to get one that is in great shape I'm, I've, I've got a besomatic that is just like butter i love shooting that camera but this ultramatic it's another one that mike and i went around because uh, mike did a comparative review of the uh, contorex and the ultramatic and and mike actually ended up siding uh pretty much on the ultramatic uh but the, the issue that i'm finding is uh mirror desilvering, right? You look mm -hmm. through them and it looks like somebody's taken a can of Krylon black spray paint and just splotched it all through the uh, the viewfinder. Uh, mm -hmm. Things like uh, resilvering mirrors, is that the, it is eyeing art or is that something that can be done or it's just something that you prefer to do? Resilvering is very doable. It's a, a pretty safe process and you don't need a lot of a lot of space or gear for it. What's most realistic though would be to find a uh, find a front surface mirror that is of a same or very very similar thickness and cut it down to shape and install and then calibrate. That's far more realistic because with the original you could yeah you could pull it you could polish it bring it down resilver it put it back in. But if you can find a piece of glass that has front surface coating and that is within you know, a quarter of a millimeter in terms of thickness that would bring it within the tolerances of what it could be calibrated. And then you cut to size and put in there. Um, that would be the realistic way to do it. So not a lost cause. Not a lost cause. All right. I'd like to hear that. If you have a Canon Pelix with a mirror that, that's falling apart, I can't do much for you there. <laughs> Pretty much all Canon Pelix is the mirror is shot on them. I mean, yeah. I, I actually did get one that was usable but uh, it was already quite, you know, degraded as it was. But to find yeah. a Pelix, if for anybody not familiar, the, the Pelix has a pellicle mirror, which uh, is basically like a beam splitter, essentially. It's like the range, I'm sorry, an SLR reflex mirror that doesn't move. And uh, it allows light to both simultaneously pass through mm -hmm. it and into the viewfinder, which is just, you know, a great idea in the sense that you don't have a mirror moving. But for one when you shoot that camera, it's still just as noisy as any normal reflexes. Like it wasn't any quieter. It darkened the viewfinder by something like 30%. Uh, mm -hmm. And any dirt and debris, since you're exposing light that's passing physically through the mirror, any scratches, fingerprints, dust, degraded foam that's sitting on the mirror is going to affect the light hitting your film too. So great idea. It was clearly a proof of concept perhaps because um, uh, Canon and Nikon did eventually release, Sony did too, um, pellicle versions of the F1, I think the F3, they were meant for um, uh, special edition motor drive versions that could shoot like 12 exposures a second for the Olympics or something like that. I don't remember the specifics, mm -hmm. but by eliminating the moving mirror allows the motor drive uh, to go faster. So there were other practical uses for that technology, but just for the sake of doing it, um, yeah, the Pelix is a one-off for a reason, but still very cool. The, the Ultramatics and the Supermatics are, are pretty nice. I've got one. We've, we've talked about these before. I will pull it up in a moment. They've got a very bad reputation in terms of reliability. So I'm just wondering how badly service people want to avoid working on these things. <laughs> I've got a, um, the Greenomatic is making a reappearance. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the Petri, um, I'm not sure what model it is, but the, the range finder, the, the color corrected super 2.8. Now I've got one here and it's actually, it's actually mostly working, but the slow speeds are gone. The slow speeds are off completely. Um, how, how do you feel about working on cameras which have a real reliability issue uh, or reliability reputation? 
And um, we were watching. I'm watching Mike hold up multiple green omatics at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if yeah. any of them actually work for him, but well, yeah. Well, the problem with those sorts of cameras is um, they have quite complicated mechanics and design. The design of those mechanics were as polished as for the cameras. So for that, um, they do become like uh, Alex was saying before, a camera that you need to continue to rework on. So if you're a technician and it is your camera and something happens and you know kind of how to use it, so that won't happen, um, they can be beautiful, but otherwise they do tend to come back. Uh, once you fix one thing that makes um, something else in the mechanism not work correctly uh, and that pushes something else on the mechanism not to work. And in turn, it just, um, you're always adjusting. You're always having to adjust. That, that's my experience anyways. I can tell you with that camera specifically, when they work, they're very nice. But what I think is was Petri's Achilles heel, both with their range finders and their SLRs, is they built their own shutters. They were not like mm -hmm. most other Japanese companies that would use like Copal shutters or Seiko shutters. The shutter and the Petri green -omatic, and as you guys saw, I have four of them. The reason I have four is they're all slightly different versions. One of them is uh, a DeJure Petri, um, which was a very uncommon rebranded version of it. But um, they all have Petri made shutters, which I think the rangefinder one, it's like a, a fairly typical Japanese leaf shutter. So there is at least hope. But their SLRs have, um, Ryan, have you ever taken apart a Petri SLR? Unfortunately, so. <laughs> you know you know what I'm talking about. They use like a torsion spring. The, as best as I could describe it, if you could picture a garage door, right? Every garage door above it has a big long rod with a coiled spring. And the idea is, is with the garage door, the garage door is much heavier than you realize. So for a person to lift it up or garage door to lift it up, the spring helps uh, like pull it up. It helps eliminate that stress. Well, Petri took that same concept and uses that coiled spring. So like I have a video on my website. You can actually watch it. I took the bottom plate off of a slightly working Petri SLR. And when you wind the lever to cock the, the shutter, you actually see that, that spring twisting. And then when you go to fire the shutter, it just flies back to its original uh, orientation and that's the tension that it's using to move the blades which probably made a lot of sense they were probably like hey let's try something different no one else is doing this let's do it well clearly it hasn't held up over time and i don't think anybody knows or even wants to learn how to fix them so um i think overall like petri lenses are very good i have the petri penta somewhere over there if you can find one that works great images but they almost never do and if you do pay to get one of the green omatics Theo fixed. Um, it's kind of like the, the cell you about a few minutes later, something else will probably go wrong with it. So, and it's a shame too, cause they, they, they really are nice cameras. They feel good in the hands. It feels nice. It's yeah. The ergonomics of it are almost as perfect as you can get from a 35 millimeter Japanese range finder. I just wish that they were more reliable. So I uh, just say, and the green window is just gorgeous. Yeah, that's right. I think that the problem with like uh, us camera repairers trying to specialize on these more niche camera brands and types, and it is hard because you do kind of have to put quite a lot of time into them and the likelihood of them coming into the shop as a common repair makes the uh, time invested into learning how to repair that camera um, you know, something to think about. I don't know. I, I had that question. I, I had actually had a question. Why do you want, what do you want to specialize on when it comes to like, you know, the next move for uh, your camera repair shop? Kind of two big questions are what's next for the shop and what's next for me in terms of what I want to work on. Um, my initial answer is that like, I grow uh, weary of working on one system for too long over and over and over again. And that's why I like to jump around. Two years ago, I went on a huge deep dive on the Contact 645 because um, the man I purchased Pro Camera from has a rental business called Contact Rental, and he rents them to wedding photographers throughout the United States and sometimes the UK. Um, and other than Nippon in New York, um, and then for uh, formerly, I think, Hughes in Utah, um, not a whole lot of folks would work on them. And so I knew it was like, A, lucrative, B, just a stunning camera. I really wanted to be able to do 
as much as possible on that camera. And so I, I went really hard on it and I can bring it down to the, the blades and back up again. And um, I was super proud of it. And then I did a couple hundred of them. Um, and I was like, man, I don't want to, I don't want to see a contact again. And so I realized that just peppering different systems in, and I go through phases, right. And I go through days too. Sometimes I'll say like, today is a rolly day and I'll do a handful of rollies and it's awesome. that I'm in rolly mode. And then I'll be like, man, I don't want to touch a rolly again. And then we'll jump. It'll be a Leica M day or a Leica M week. Like if I were to live my dream world, I would only work on probably Hasselblad, Rolly, and like M. Just utterly love those systems. They're so elegant, so fun to work on, so simple and so well made. Um, it feels like you're working on an art project as much as you are a camera every time, as I'm sure you know. But then that kind of ties into what I want to do with the shop is if I can grow the business to a size that supports multiple technicians, um, I can maybe do that. I can maybe be you know, the, the Leica M guy under our roof and then have, you know, some other folks who are naturally enthusiastic about other systems. And so I really want to be able to, to hire younger folks, teach them the stuff that I've got from, you know, my mentors. And then if they latch onto something and they're, you know, for any reason, if they're like, man, I love working on Petri rangefinders, <laughs> then they'll be the Petri guy or gal. That's great. Um, so yeah, bringing, bringing more folks in, training them, and then allowing them to find their niche and grow um, is my long-term dream for the shop. I was just wondering, how are you finding dividing your time with, uh, with you know, you being the main repairer and finding people to train? Because training people takes a lot of time. And I can see you guys stopped just around the same time that I stopped, but I, I'm, obviously I'm training myself, not training somebody else. It's a balance. Um, I don't have a clear cut solution for you yet. I wish I did. Um, I've got some awesome staff um, who are in it for the long haul with me and they like really believe in what we're trying to do with the shop and, and in this project of keeping these cameras alive. And so I've got one staff member, Madison, who um, has been working here coming up on two years now. And she, she really wants to find her niche with repair stuff. And it's kind of just, you know, when we've got some downtime or the revenue at the shop's looking good and we can afford to sink an afternoon into a camera system, we sort of sneak it in and make it happen. Um, you know, for the right, for the, for the time being, um, that's why I've been doing the, uh, the repair waves and throttling things so that I can find days in my schedule to continue learning. Cause as you know, you know, as confident and savvy as you get, you, there's, there's got to be a learning day, like once a week, you know, if it's not every day, right? Like every day is fundamentally a learning day, but you have to have your volume days where you just tear through stuff that you feel good about it. You know, you're putting out a good product. And then you've got to have your days where you, you know, you have a practice camera that you can totally goof up and break, or, uh, you know, you take those risks and you slowly add stuff to your list. So it'll it definitely, yeah, there's no clear cut answer, but it's not a lot of sleep and a lot of caffeine. And um, I'm still looking for that for for that technician who can, wants to take the jump with uh with pro camera and and try to train with me Ryan, my, my follow-up question is that you know there are a few camera systems that are notoriously complicated and difficult and it seems that there have been like one old guy that has kept the flame going like there's the, there's the guy with the contorex with the 10-year wait list to get it repaired and yeah. uh and you know we just lost chris sherlock who i actually had sent my my dad's retina reflex three down too because i couldn't even find anybody in germany that would touch it uh, mm -hmm. I, sp I spent a long week in berlin going to camera shops they're like no 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 wow <laughs> we won't touch that one anymore uh yeah so as you know some of these some of these notoriously cranky old guys uh you know as they are they, they as they stop working on these cameras are these going to be cameras that uh just become unserviceable or are, are there cameras like that, that that you're willing to give a flyer and, and try to figure it out, even though they, they have this reputation, sort of like the, the mm -hmm. contacts with its shutters? Uh, you know, are, 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 I'm, just, I'm just curious as to know how you think about that. I li I, I'm glad you said notoriously cranky old guy. <laughs> that's, a, that's a whole other conversation that I hope we get into. But my opinion is that, like, as much as these cameras appear to be sort of occurrences in their own right in terms of like 
they're vastly complex and sometimes very unapproachable. And they're these, you know, watch like machines that are all silver and chrome and leather. They were made by people, right? They were made by human beings and human beings who had access to less technology than we do today, right? They were drafting and they were using slide rules. So as long as there's literature somewhere for how these things went together or after they've been put together, how to keep them going. So the, you know, the project of preserving repair literature is super vital. And that's, you know, learn camera repair has been amazing in that, right? If the, if the paperwork is there and the objects are there, uh, and there's still patient enough people, um, I frankly am not that concerned. You, you just got to find folks who are willing to sit down long enough and bang their head against the wall enough times. But if people made it, people can, other than maybe like the pyramids, <laughs> we haven't figured that one out, but for cameras, they're recent enough. I think if we're patient enough and optimistic, we can keep, keep this stuff going. Fantastic news. Both yourself and Jess mentioned the mentors and you've, you've been through various mentors, I imagine on different camera systems, et cetera. Obviously that's, that's hugely important as well in terms of passing the information. Is, is it a problem finding a mentor? Uh, because I mean, some guys just don't want to share this information or is it, or have people have been quite open and helpful and, um, and, and allowing the, you know, the information and the, you know, not just the information, the tools, the literature to be shared. This is my favorite question. And I'm sure, I'm sure Jess can speak to it as well. Jess, you want to go first on this one? I've kind of been gifted. Um, I have now four mentors. Um, I have a person, a guy that kind of did all sorts of cameras because he lived in a region of Australia that was countryside. So he had a quite a large amount of area all for himself. So he did all sorts of models. Um, I just acquired a Leica mentor that I acquire all the Leica tools and um, manuals from. I have Alex, he was an Olympus, an Olympus um, technician for 20 years. Uh, and just today I met um, a Canon representative. There was a Canon technician for 20 years and he will be coming here for one day a week. So I've been very gifted that I have the people that have the time to teach this. A lot of, I've, I've reached before, I reached to a lot of camera places and camera shops, see if somebody could teach me. Um, but the truth is that they're busy trying to make a living and teaching camera technician <laughs> techniques take time and take a lot of patience and take the right kind of person. And, and for, for a long time, I, I looked and I couldn't uh, find anybody that had the, had the time. And a lot of the people are getting old and they're also forgetting, you know? But yeah, I don't, I don't know. How do you feel about it, Ryan? A little bit of both of what you're describing. Really lucky that I had Bill Moretz, who was a longtime East Coast technician who uh, received factory training. He, I think he started on projectors and then went to cameras and was a long time factory trained technician. And the, the reality of it is he kind of greased the wheels for me, um, which was super valuable because he helped me skip probably a couple years of mistakes um, and then it allowed me to accelerate. But um, once COVID happened, he, he had to be home. So I had him for maybe 15 minutes a week. And so um, as frustrating as it was, I was also glad because I could maybe break something on a Tuesday and have to wait until the next Monday for him to come in. And I'd get impatient and be like, man, I don't want to wait. So let's either like break it worse or figure out how to make it work. Um, and then he'd come in and he'd like wave his hands over it and it would work again. So he got me going. But then a lot of, a lot of what I learned and a lot of my mentors have been YouTube and the internet and um, the occasional phone call where, where I find a technician who has some time. Um, but like you said, it's, it's tough because anybody who is currently alive, whose body is not failing them, they're booked. And it's not a smart financial decision to teach anybody. That said, there are some individuals who maybe have the time or um, could find it in themselves, and they don't want to. And that's where the cranky old man side of the conversation comes in. And it's complicated. And I understand it because these quote unquote cranky old men worked to accrue these sets of skills for many, many years. And then they watched those skills uh, pretty rapidly become 
either obsolete or far undervalued in the market of ideas. And then in the last, call it what you want, six, three, two years, everybody is like, man, how cool is this? We got to get these cameras running again. And a lot of these older folks are like, we didn't go anywhere. (laughs) We've just been kind of chipping away on our workbenches and our sleepy camera shops for 20 years. So there, there's a degree of sometimes chip on the shoulder, like I earned this, why should I give it to you kind of thing. And there are times in which that personal investment and ego can be stronger and or outweigh that individual's desire for the craft to continue. I'm not going to name the individual, but a very well-respected, long-time repair person for a certain camera system in the United States I reached out to and said, will you train me? Here's where I am on this system. I'd love to know, you know, a little bit more. And it was a couple of years ago when I was about to dive into this as a career. And I said, I absolutely love this. And it's so fun. And I want to make this a career if I can. And he wrote back and he said, don't do it. (laughs) Um, He said, do not do this because the problem with repairing cameras is you have to be more anal than your most anal client and they ruin it for you. Understandably, that's a bit of a discouraging response to get, but at the same time, it strengthened my resolve because uh, it introduced the possibility to me that I could still perhaps do this, but not come out on the other end of a career with that outlook on it. And that's where getting young people into it, and if we have to, figuring it out by ourselves is the, the avenue if we have to go that way. Like we're totally blessed with people who find it in themselves to, to be patient enough to teach us. But if we got to, we're going to figure it out too. And then hopefully by the end of it, not be like, you know, a shell of a man, that's super, <laughs> super angry and not willing to share any of that knowledge with the next generation. I think I've gotten some emails from that guy before. <laughs> How much does the, the, the customer role in this also play? Because that that's the thing I like. These cranky old men didn't become cranky because they want to be cranky and 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 that uh, they're being pummeled. They're being they're they're literally being you know yelled at by people because they want their cameras fixed and they want them perfect and they want them tomorrow. I mean, is, is that something as customers we need to be rec- rec- we need to recognize? Otherwise, we're going to push people away from being able to do this. Yeah, totally. Um, shameless plug. I wrote an article for Thirty Five MMC coming up on a year ago, probably, maybe not quite that long, but it's all about that dynamic of what we need to sort of reconfigure in terms of our expectations, getting into this as a consumer to try to sort of rehumanize the repair person moving forward because there are so few of us. It used to be that the repair facility was a black box. The camera went in, it came out. If it wasn't perfect, we'd raise all hell. There aren't enough of us anymore for that to be the case. And so we need to sort of reconsider uh, what's realistic. And as the cameras age, they get harder and harder to repair. Like Bill, my mentor in his 70s, he's describing an ecosystem of camera issues that's vastly different than what it was 15, 20 years ago when these objects were still considered old collectibles. And so the lubricants are drying out in ways we didn't anticipate. The metal is aging in ways we didn't anticipate. So the cameras are getting harder to fix. The parts are getting harder to find. The repair people are all, people are all dying or don't want to share their information. And now we have, uh, you know, arguably hundreds of thousands of more people who are very interested in getting into this craft. And it just, it bears uh, a pause before you dive in to recognize that you're getting into something that is fundamentally considered to be obsolete, right? Like we have, we moved on from these cameras because we found a better, cheaper, faster way to do it. That, you know, better is, you know, right. to some people it's better, et cetera. But there, there needs to be a call for, for patience and understanding on both sides of the repair and the consumer spectrum. And an understanding that until there are more of us to fix things, you know, it's going to take a while, but we both, the repair person and the consumer 
we both love these cameras. We both want to keep them running. You bring up a point that I've discussed with people many times before. You know, Paul sells a lot of cameras on, on eBay and, you know, he he sometimes will get them serviced. But even when he does, you know, Alex's uh, Leica that you have there, even after the CLA, it's still a 70, 80 year old camera that's been CLA, you know, and to expect anything, no matter how much it's been tested or cleaned or lubricated to still function with perfect precision and perfect timings almost a century after they were created is, is just totally unrealistic. And another thing you had mentioned, people adjusting expectations, right? Like we live in a disposable society. When my smartphone yep. dies, I just throw it away, right? When this laptop dies, I just well, recycle it, whatever. You know, we don't fix things like we used to. I just had to buy a new refrigerator because our six-year-old yeah. fridge died. We had to get a new one, right? You, you can't even get them fixed anymore. But what a, a lot of people sometimes forget, you know, they say they don't make them like they used to. And while that's technically true, when you bought a Leica M3 or you bought a Nikon rangefinder or, you know, even a Canon SLR, it was never an expectation that they never needed to go back in for work. Like it was normal maintenance, right? We take our cars in for oil changes and get the spark plugs changed every once in a while. Cameras were the same way. And I think sometimes yeah. people forget that, right? A camera that was serviced 10 years ago, if it's been sitting on that shelf, you're like, oh yeah, I just had it serviced 10 years ago. Well, it's ready for another service already. Mike, what's yes. a spark plug? What's a spark plug? Yeah, <laughs> um, that's true too. You know, I mean, you used to get tune-ups every, what, 20,000 miles. Now it's, you know, never. People will buy a new car and they'll sell it before it ever gets its first spark plugs changed or anything like that. But, you know, you mm -hmm. bring up a, a bunch of good points. Uh, but then I want to bring up a third point too. And this is something that I've talked about many, many times in my site. And when people ask me like, why do you collect cameras and what, what interests you so much about them? And I, I could spend a whole show talking about what I like about cameras, but what pertains to this discussion is of anything like antique or vintage that you could collect. Cameras are one of the few things that still do their intended purpose in some cases better than they did when they were new, right? Like take a 1930s Leica and put in some T-Max film in it. And you're going to get sharper, nicer images than anything that people were getting in the 30s. You know, you put some Kodak Ektar 100 in, in a camera. And I know everybody misses Kodachrome, but you know, you're getting vibrant colors that look sharper and with greater detail than you ever could in the past. People, it, when you adapt lenses, you're, you're extracting more resolution out of those vintage lenses on digital sensors than ever was possible before. So in addition to all the cool things you could say about these cameras, they're beautiful, the tactile experience, the sound, the connectiveness that mm -hmm. you get when shooting, you're also in, in an industry, or a, a, I should say, um, a collector's world where these things still work as good, if not better than they ever did before. And that's something that uh, an antique automobile does not handle or accelerate mm -hmm. or stop or is as safe as a modern vehicle is, right? Uh, antique computers, you know, people have to jump through hoops. I, I have an old uh, Fuji uh, uh, FinePix S1 Pro which was the Fuji digital camera they put in a Nikon body. And I had to jump through hoops just to be able to get it to work and get the images off of it on my computer. And that camera is only 20 some years old, right? Electronics do not age well, right? Magnetic media will be completely unusable in a couple decades. But, you know, these, these mechanical wonders are worth fixing. You know, back to Anthony's EF, it's worth fixing. Alex is like uh, these old Nikons, but... You have to have the right expectations. An 80 year old camera that CLA is still 80 years old. And even after you do get it working, don't expect to never have to send it in again for another adjustment at some point too. So mm -hmm. um, to have people like you and Jess and the few people who are just getting into this, it's a challenge to find the people that want to do it, that have the knowledge and the skill. But now you're telling me that it's getting even harder and harder to find the parts you know, you could one day be in a situation where there's people willing to fix like us, but no one can get curtain materials anymore. And that's just, that's sad, but that's, you know, a reality I think we all face. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that Ryan is, uh, the business model that he started working on, and you, you can, I'll let you explain this, but Ryan does it. You don't just send the camera in. You have a, a window of opportunity to send it in. And when that window closes, he, he fixes what he has in the house 
then the window opens again, which is a, a good way to, to manage expectations. But it's a business model that's really unusual. Most repair places and everybody that does retail wants all the business they can get right now. And sometimes that creates problems because you can wait for, especially in camera repair. I use Uxin for uh, the Leica repairs. And right now he's uh, 16 weeks. So you send it in and then you just wait for 16 weeks for it to get done. How are you handling it now, Ryan? You're you're opening about every six weeks? Yeah, about every six weeks. I'm calling it basically a wave system. So um, wave one was a couple months ago. And I think wave, we're coming up on wave three or four, but it's exactly what you said. It's managing expectations. And you can, I can open the floodgates and everybody can send me their camera and I can become a storage facility and I can pay more on my business insurance for what, you know, what value I have on the shelf. Or the camera can stay safely in your, you know, house and your bedroom, and it can come in when it's time. Um, and I want to do it that way because no matter what somebody says, they understand. Folks are so eager to get these cameras repaired, which is understandable. I get it. And so as soon as it goes in the box and it leaves their house, even if they themselves have said, I completely understand it's going to be 12 weeks, no problem. Week seven comes around and they're calling you. Week eight comes around, they're calling you. And they're like, hey, I know you said 12, but just wanted to check on it, just wanted to check on it. And I get it, you want your cool camera you know, fixed and back in your hand. But if I just cut out all of that anticipation and cut it down to, you know, well, I'm still shooting for six to eight weeks, it makes the process smoother. And it also sort of weeds out folks who in the immediate term until I have more staff, Folks, I may not be interested in working with in terms of their expectations of like, I need it and I need it now. Because if you're not willing to set the reminder on your phone or set the reminder on your calendar, you know, and say like, hey, watch, watch his Instagram, watch his website um, to get in the queue, then you may not actually want that camera repaired as much as you say you do. Um, And so, yes, it it can be frustrating. It can be a little, you know, irritating. Darn, I missed that wave. Um, But the camera has been waiting for 40 years. And another six weeks is not going to kill you or the camera. And so it's a bit of a tough love approach, but I think in the long run, it is going to result in happier customers, a happier repair person, uh, and better work in terms of the quality of the work that's happening to the cameras. And then one one side note workaround that I'm about to launch is um, a professional subscription program. So Basically, if you can show me that you have an active business license or articles of incorporation as an LLC and that you use this equipment to put food on your table and, you know, save for your kids, call, whatever, right? You make a living with this gear, then it's, we're, we're having a completely different conversation. And I'm here to, to service that stuff on a, on a faster timeline, obviously for a higher price. Um, but the working professionals, I will also be um, accepting repairs. Uh, at any time if they buy into the subscription model. It's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome that you do that. Um, Just one quick question for me is when you do open up that window, you said that sometimes maybe you're in a rolling mood, sometimes you're in a like a mood or whatever. Do you take whatever you can in that window or do you further break it down of, okay, the window is open now for rollies or, or something? No, I take whatever I can within the window, which I think I would have some unhappy folks if I said I'm only taking the rolly folks this month. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I take, you know, whatever comes in, comes in. I'm about to have put up a publish like a no fly list in terms of stuff that for the time being, I just won't touch to, because hopefully, you know, you, you see that list and, and then you don't send the camera in just for me to say, sorry, you know, here's an invoice for return shipping. But yeah, a little bit of a little bit of everything can come in when the gates are open. Um, Steve, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Uh, you know, you came on the show. Anything curiosity for you? I don't know if I can get some free advice, but I have I have both a Nikon mat and a Nikon F2 that uh, where somehow the advance is frozen, the shutter is frozen, and uh, you know, just wonder. Uh, and it happened you know, kind of spontaneously with both of them. And I wonder if there's anything I can look at by, let's say, pulling off the bottom or anything. I'll just answer for them. The right answer is send them in. (laughs) Send them in to Um, get repaired. (laughs) Yeah. But, you know, something somebody explained to me once before, and Ryan or Jess, tell me if I'm wrong, but in most SLRs, 
the shutter release does not directly fire the shutter. The shutter release begins moving the mirror. The mirror moving out of the way then triggers the shutter to fire. Is that okay? They're shaking their heads. Yes. So it's been my experience because I come through a lot of cameras that sometimes just giving it a good whack, you know, uh, has actually worked. Um, I am no stranger to just dumping naphtha oil or lighter fluid inside of a camera. And that might be good only for one roll. Mm -hmm. But on my site, I review camera. I only shoot a roll, maybe even half a roll sometimes. And if all you're trying to do is just kick that thing in the butt and get it going again, a lot of times when you have that problem, Steve, especially cameras like the Nickermat and the F or F2 that are known to be very reliable cameras, like these cameras usually don't break. If it's not working, something's just yeah. dumbed up. It, and it almost certainly is mm -hmm. the mirror linkage. The other thing that you can do, and, and it's amazing how often this works, is run the self-timer. Because by running the self timer, you're yeah. bypassing the shutter release, and uh, you're going to a different mm -hmm. method of yeah. releasing the the uh, again the linkage to move. So I'm not saying that's going to solve the problem, but that's certainly a first thing to try. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Can I just add a warning here? Camerosity podcast does not condone <laughs> whacking your camera against the wall oh, or the table, okay. <laughs> and we take no responsibility for any damage caused. <laughs> Yeah. Cameras get out of cycle. They get out of sequence when, when things, things, things don't always move in the right, correct order. And uh, sometimes it's, it's simple to reset them and sometimes it isn't. Well, the F3 can sometimes get out of cycle exactly as you describe, but by using the manual shutter release, that little button actually will, will reset it. You, I think you have to set it to T or B mode, and then you fire the shutter a couple of times with the mechanical button, and then put the shutter speed dial back to the one of the other speeds and miraculously it'll work again. So, yeah. um, you know, a proper lubrication, a proper cleaning is always going to be the best way to go about it. There's something caused that to happen. Right, Something exactly. It to happen. And, it and even if you're running again, but that, that isn't going to solve yep. the problem in the long run. Yes, it's gonna come back. It, it's and you don't need you don't need to sell you okay. for it to come back. Any no matter how good a camera is, right. it, shade tree repairs will only work temporarily. Okay. And and Theo is saying the percussive method of repair uh, is not a good option. So well, you know, it, it can be a stress reliever. <laughs> You know, <laughs> if it's a Petri or, a, you know, an Exacta or something that uh, uh, never hurts to bang them around a little bit. But. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I do have one other question. As a 72-year-old guy, I, I really would love to um, learn how to repair, um, how to get inside and, you know, and be able to put a camera back together. I've I done I did that once a few years ago. It didn't do it. I, I tried it on an old Nicromat. I got I still have I think about three or four Nicromats that cost me ten dollars for the lot, you know, because they they were for repair. But I also just got two Nicorex F bodies that don't work, and uh, maybe they'd be a little easier. Do either one of you have a um, suggestion for a uh, for a camera that would be good to start with, or are they all kind of complicated? So? Any 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 SLRs are are are. Are, are not complicated and if you are have time to read through the like ryan said the learn camera repair website um they do have quite a nice um course through mm -hmm. there that you can read through the material okay. um and it will get you pretty acquainted with all the parts um on an slr slrs are not that complicated right so get some good tools okay uh yeah don't, don't buy don't buy a cheap tool what I can't use my Dollar Tree um, screwdriver set. Well, you can, but you're better off to spend a couple of bucks and get some <laughs> JI screwdrivers. And a tool, I don't know if you even call it a tool, but something that I use a lot are these things. These are little rubber lens. It, it kind of is that you usually can get them. You can get these from Amazon. Um, there's usually six sizes. I never use the two smallest ones. But if you're going to take apart a camera, uh, you know, you sometimes you have to use a lens spanner to get the front ring off, but I don't know. I just yeah. suck at lens spanners. Right. 90% of the time it slips out of my hand and I end up scratching the hell out of it. But if you use these, you know, you just kind of press it. And, and that's like what a, uh -huh, that's a, uh, like a rubber. Amazon sells this as like, it's literally meant for disassembling lenses. I don't know if, if that's what Ryan or, or Jessica would use, but yeah, Ryan's shaking his head. If you are starting to build. Uh, a set of tools at home, get really good, as, as much money as you could afford precision screwdrivers. 
lens or Jessica's holding up some there too. And hers are day glow. Yeah. Hers are day glow. Mine are black rubber. Get uh, the best lens spanner you could afford. Get one that locks and get one that has some fingers that go straight and others that bent. There's other ones that have like angled because you're, you're going to need them for different things. Yep. Jess is holding up her spanner and get and get one of these. I would say for a home person just looking to learn themselves, not necessarily start a business. Those are the three things you really need to have. And, and I'll actually say a fourth thing. A fourth thing is a big open workspace that's clean, clutter, preferably not on a room with carpet. <laughs> For obvious reasons, because yeah. you lose a screw in a carpet. And good JIS gonna... screwdrivers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah a good exactly. set of JIS screwdrivers. This Philips will just um, wreck right. your screws. Oh, JIS, yep. yes. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. This is great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. A good overhead light too would be a good good option oh, yeah. as well. Good lighting, definitely. Alex. Yeah, I have a, a few questions, but I would add. Um, especially if you're into to Nikon stuff, uh, Richard Haw has a pretty good website that details even step-by-step, -step, you know, cameras, lenses, the tools, how to take them apart. And uh, I've, I've quite admired reading through a lot of his articles on, uh, on repair. I'm just oh, not brave yeah. enough yet to try to take, take apart a I lens. I couldn't remember that name. Thank you so much, Alex. I, I ran into him a couple of years ago into his website. So uh, Richard Haw and the other one was Learn, Learn Camera yes. Repair. Learn website. Camera Repair. We'll have links to those in the show notes. So Ryan, after Stevens had a go at that Learn Camera Repair and followed it, you might be receiving a few packages, I imagine, because the first few usually don't go so well. Here comes another <laughs> camera with a Ziploc full of parts. A couple of there bags full of camera parts, yeah. A kit. <laughs> Ryan, you've come across, uh, and, and I've been messaging you about them, some, uh, some unique uh, of the uh, uh, Japanese rangefinders uh, recently, your uh, Yashika YF, as well as the, uh, I saw you just sent off the, uh, I'd message you about the 3L uh what where where have you been finding those and i'm also curious too on the on the vein of how repairable are certain cameras right you know i i was contemplating acquiring that that yf but i think okay how repairable could this be in the future there's not a lot mm -hmm. of them out there um you know what's what's sort of the take on that especially when it comes to some of those copies the the nika and the 3l and the yf is a kind of a new world for me. I've found that first crazy clean uh, 3L um, eight, eight or so months ago. I got a ridiculous price on it, bought it, fell in love with it, did my usual fickle thing, flipped it, sold it, never should have. And so um, I just have a reminder set on my eBay search um, notifications. And at any time anything that matches a 3L listing pops up, I'll get an email. And it's just a question of like, was I lucky enough to wake up at 2 a.m. and check my email? Um, so I just got another 3L that I sent off to Enzo for repaint. And I, to my knowledge, that was like, that's maybe the second one to make it into the United States it, since I got that other one. Paul and, and these guys might might know anybody who's, who snagged a recent one, but I, I look like every day. And if one pops up, I grab it. And the 3Ls, We'll, we will be able to keep those running because of the amount of YFs that are out there, even though those are also rare cameras. They're similar enough on the inside. They share the same parts bin. The YFs were basically just a slightly de-refined version of the 3L. Um, it doesn't have the automatic film resetting counter um, and a couple other bits and bobs. But under the hood, I, the first time I took apart the 3L, I was just like incredibly pleased and I think probably laughed out loud a little at how just like simple and elegant and easily accessible the inside of those cameras were. So um, I don't know, barring any unforeseen um, acts of God, I don't see why we won't keep the, the YFs and the 3Ls running. The 3L has a little pin you can see in the film compartment and that actually resets the exposure counter. So it is the only bottom loading 35 millimeter that I can think of. I'm sure there's another but it resets the exposure counter when you open it up, just like you, normally when you open the back wood, but it's a bottom loader. So um, they did add some different bits, you know, back lever wine. It's got the Leica M3 style door, you know, for viewing the shutter curtains and stuff like that. But I would suspect at least the shutter itself is pretty familiar. Um, but, you know, like if you may have trouble with, 
the exposure counter or something, you know, because for lack of parts or something. They're such cool cameras. When you yeah. like, when you line up the list of, of boxes that that camera checked next to an M3 at the time that it checked it, other than a bayonet mount and very slight refinements in, in production quality and materials, those are dunning cameras in terms of what they were achieving at the time they achieved it. Um, they're really, really cool. I wish I figured those things out a little sooner because there are just none of them out there. Now setting up eBay alerts. <laughs> Hold on. Yeah. Well, Mike, you'd asked me to try to come up with a, uh, a round robin question that we can finish up with. So I guess that for our people that are here, not Ryan or Jessica, what is the next camera you're sending off for repair? And I'll, I'll start, and it's probably going to be a, a Canon, my 4SB, my IVSB, with the uh, shutter capping or the shutter capping and the, and the pinholes uh, it will probably be hitting Ryan during the next wave. It's, it's very jewel like I've got a couple of Barnett clones It's my favorite to shoot, but boy, it's got shutter issues right now. So Paul, what, what are you sending off next? Well, aside from the Yashica flex and the uh, Nikon S I've got a, uh, a near mint Nikon 10525 F mount that has one shutter blade. That's uh, out of position. It, it's not it's not cracked it's not split it's just it's just loose so i'm going to send that down and see if you can do anything with it it's that's such a nice lens and uh it works great on uh on mirrorless cameras so i i, I just want to get it fixed and uh set pass it on to somebody else that can that can use it oh i'm going to go again because i'm going to nominate theo to send just the uh superb jess has got the superb it is with her now so um just for everybody who's listening, a bit of historical context, I came across two superbs and bought a second one by accident. And I know Anthony's been looking for one for a long time. And I, uh, the second one needs a bit of work done to it. It's in a lot of five cameras that I kind of sort of dumped on Jess the other day. Um, Jess, you've had them for a week now. Why aren't they fixed yet? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> there, but, is, there um, is a small all delay on my bench time just 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 about uh, you know a couple of months <laughs> it, it is with jess uh along with um a leica r3 a uh yashica electro tx a super econta and god there was something else as well there was another <laughs> voilanda there was another voilanda as well oh yes the voilanda with uh, the test of the barn doors one that just needs uh, a range front alignment and um, some stickiness sorted out. Jess, were, were you ever able to get your superb up and running? Yes, yes, my one, my one's running, but I, I've I've put a roll through, but I haven't actually developed it. You're killing, you're killing me. You you have to develop it the day you shoot it. Nah, <laughs> if I had time now, if I had time, whenever I have time, I'm either reading a, reading a manual or tinkering on some sort of camera or disassembling or reassembling or something, you know? <laughs> so Mike, what are you sending off next? So I'll give you three answers to that. I'll show you the one that I probably should send off. I have um, an M3 here. It's got the dual range Sumacron with the goggles, uh, beautiful condition. I got this from my neighbor after he passed away. Um, the top two shutter speeds, 1000 does the curtains don't separate at all one five hundredth that you get like half of a frame so this is a camera that is only going to increase in va uh, value i should get it serviced um the camera that i want to get serviced believe it or not i have never shot an exacta that works properly i would really like to send an exacta to somebody not it doesn't necessarily have to be this one i just grabbed the first one i could handle but I do really like exactas, but I've never shot one that works perfectly. So I kind of want to get one service just to say that I have. But the camera I probably will um, is going to be my Canon VT Deluxe. Um, I absolutely love this camera. Theo, you have one, I think, almost exactly the same. Yes. It's yeah. got the bottom trigger wine, you know, film advance. It's got the titanium um, curtains. I have my 50 millimeter viewfinder on it now. Normally there's a lens attached, but it's borrowed on something else. 
I love Canon's rotating prism for the different focal lengths. There's just so many things I like about this camera, but it, it too has a shutter capping issue where even at the, the mid speed 60, 125, which are usually pretty safe, I'm noticing this one side of my image is darker than the other. So uh, this is probably the one that'll get it simply because this is one I've, I've shot like four or five times. I want to keep shooting it. It checks almost all the boxes that I want for it. Um, whereas if I spent the time and money on an exact, I would probably shoot it once and put it back on the shelf. So, um, my, my vote is the Canon. Do you, do you want to borrow my exacta Varex? Does it work perfectly? It's brand new out of the box. Really? Okay. It's pristine. I might. Works perfectly. I'm still, uh, looking forward to those Zeiss, um, folders though. Um, okay. I want to yep, yep. try one of those, but, uh, yeah, I, I would like to have the experience of, um, you know, any Heggy exacta that, that doesn't have pinholes or screwed up slow speed governor or some other goofy issue. No, I've probably shot a thousand frames through mine and it's, it's perfect. Yeah. Alex, you sending anything off? I know that you have three there with, uh, with Ryan now what's, what's next in the queue. Uh, you know, I've got two recent, uh, gas, uh, items that came in, uh, that I, I need to do the shakedown. So We'll see. You know, I got to run my test rolls through and see if anything's going off. But uh, I do have an F Nikon F that uh, could use a little bit of a little bit of cleaning, some 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 foam seal, mirror foam, and some other things. Maybe fairly minor. So, Stephen, you got anything going off next? I don't anticipate anything. You know, I um, I shoot film so very very infrequently anymore. I, I uh, oddly enough, I I did take out one of my Nikkor XF yesterday to Boston Garden and uh, photograph there. But the last time I think was over two years ago, it was an N80 Nikon that a neighbor had given me. It's actually a nice camera, the N80. I, I'm a fan of that one. Yeah, yeah you know something? It, I I think that was the body probably uh, became... It was the D40. Uh, like Nikon Digital. Well, oh, a Same D40. Body. Okay. Yeah. It was a very nice that really... And the really cheap, you know, uh, what was it, yeah. 28 to 80 something Zoom? Actually, it worked very well. So, yeah, I just, I, I don't know at the time being, you know, if, if, if I, and I'm also, I, you know, since I moved here to Massachusetts, I've gotten into radio control airplanes. And so I'm spending money on that. Too many hobbies. Two cameras I'd love to get fixed because they aren't working. I think they just, all the speeds are the same are a Minolta XC7 and an XC5. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if it pays to even fix, you know, those electronic cameras. And then, Ryan, here's the, the busman's uh, holiday question. What do you have that you need to repair? Is it like they say mechanics, their own cars are never running? Is Ryan's own personal cameras all broken? I've got a, uh, a Frank and Leica that is my baby right now. It's a M3 chassis with an M5 back door. <laughs> it's, got, it's got a late M3 top cover. And then a mid M3 rangefinder um, and all kinds of fun stuff. I tore all the flash sync and the self timer out of it and I put fresh curtains in it. And so I, I did this camera because I was like, basically, any nice camera I build for myself, I sell because I, you know, I need the money. I want the shop to have the money. So I built myself a dog of an M camera so that I probably couldn't sell it because everybody nobody you know, would ever want. <laughs> <laughs> most most like a folks would use it as a doorstop so that's my current guy right now but um i've got a couple couple other beater like a projects that are in the offing and then i really want to soon my next acquisition that i'll make uh i really want a wide rolleiflex so i've got my eye on a very beat up one at robert's camera that i might try to get pretty soon and play with that well you've had some really cool stuff come through recently you had a 50 millimeter ingenue yeah. Yep. That came and went very quickly. That was a super lucky find. Well, what was funny was a, a few days after we, you and I talked about that, John Minnick posted a picture uh, on Facebook of a picture he had shot with that. And I said, mm -hmm. you know, Ryan Jones had one of those and, and uh, John <laughs> just laughed. So I don't oh, know if he man. wound up with yours, but uh, those are pretty scarce. Yeah. Yeah. That was a lucky find. I found it in a, in a plastic bin with a bunch of for lack of a better term, kind of garbage slash shelf camera. And then there was the ingenue just sitting there. 
we're you know getting to that point where we're going to wind down the show um jess as always it's awesome to have you on the show ryan uh thank you for coming on uh, it's been a pleasure to talk to you you are welcome to come back anytime you want you don't have to answer questions about repairing cameras sometimes people like to just jump on and chat and if i could do one last bit of, of gas influence discussion previously on the podcast we've had a guest of dan tamarkin from tamarkin cameras in chicago yeah the great Leica guys and uh you know they're they're getting ready to do the next uh tamarkin rare camera auction and they just sent out their pdf catalog and you know camerosity we don't have a patreon site we don't have uh, uh you know we don't have coffee where you can like chip in and buy us coffee however if you're listening to this and you get the tamarkin catalog and you see lot number 314 they have a leica 72 that they've got up for auction and if you wanted to buy that for camerosity and donate it to us I can, I can guarantee you that we would share it equally we would all get a chance to shoot it we would we would we would put your name as you know a sponsor of a show uh remember that's that's lot 314 the leica 72 shameless absolutely shameless <laughs> Dan Tamarkin was on episode 22. I got a chance to visit him. He wants to come back. I think I'm just going to have to pull the trigger and just say, you are coming next week, you know, before, to get him on. But uh, super nice guy. For those that are unfamiliar, the, the Leica 72 is the uh, the half frame. Half frame. Yeah, it's the half frame Leica. And uh, they, they, they talk in here about the fact that there are only four lots of them made, fewer than a thousand in total. I think they were only made in Canada, right? Is that true? Uh, it just says uh, less than 200 cameras were made between okay. 1950 and 63, making it one wrong. of the rarest production screw mount Leica cameras. Uh, this one even has the rangefinder mask and a flash sink added to the rangefinder housing. So it would be a wonderful camera for us to be able to, to play around with. And, and if you're listening, Dan, we're happy to to rename the podcast, the Dan to Mark and Rossi <laughs> podcast, if you donate it to us. <laughs> this show, uh, we're on episode 34, has a net income of zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to have to start running commercials. Th this week on the Camerosity podcast, sponsored by Viagra. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, anybody else have anything, any last parting questions or words of wisdom or anything? Thank you so much for letting me uh, join you and and all of you really, you're kind of my heroes. I've been, uh, Mike, I've been following you, you know, on Facebook on your reviews for a number of years. And, and I only recently okay. found the Camerosity podcast, which is just great. And I, I appreciate all of you. It's great to, great to see uh, put faces with the uh, uh, the voices I've been hearing. Mike, I yeah. Mike, I do from Facebook. I'm glad but, to have you. Uh, on. Thank you all. And I do have a proposition for a uh, new segment of the show. It's going to be called the uh, the Rate My Rolly Thirty <laughs> Five. Uh, Paul, you'll have to rem you'll have to remind me of the scale again. It's one I, one through this eight. This one was a ten dollar. Okay, yeah, that's how many dented corners. This one was a ten dollar marketplace find. Somebody was cleaning out their house, and it looks virtually untouched. I think right. there's only one Ooh. dent in the corner so by the one. Uh, viewfinder, a but one. Uh, this is a fairly clean. You'll never find a zeros. Do, zeros do not exist. No. Well, and, and the reason why they don't exist <laughs> is because if you do manage to find one with no dents, all that means is you're gonna drop it. <laughs> so it becomes a one immediately. <laughs> All right, we will be back in two weeks. Uh, tentatively, we should record on October 24th for episode 35. We don't have anything specifically planned, but as always, the topics and discussions on the podcast are dictated entirely by you. So uh, we love having people just join us and engage with us either through the, the Facebook page, the Instagram account. Uh, we still haven't gotten on TikTok yet, but you know, you never know. All right, everybody, thank you guys for coming okay. uh, and hope to talk to you guys soon. Good night. Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you, Ryan. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. My daughter wants to know if Theo can see the sun right now and if it is really Monday. She's already in bed though, so I can't tell her, but <laughs> I have to um, I have to ask you. Okay, you can play with this Pete. Yes, I can. The sun is uh right in uh right up top at the moment because it's one o'clock in the afternoon. So it's in the middle of the day. It's right, it's sunny, it's bright, and it is Monday. All right. My daughter will be uh will be happy to hear that. I, 
I kind of think Allison has a little bit of a crush on Theo. I'm not, sh- I'm not sure if it's Theo or robot Theo. She likes better, but uh, she does ask a lot if my friend Theo is going to be on. <laughs>